Tony from I Comply here, and we're here for another segment of Having a Yarn on the Farm, where we talk about everything to do with farming. And uh, I've done a lot of serious chats on Having a Yarn on the Farm of late, and uh, I want it to be a little bit lighthearted today. And you, you might ask me, you might be wondering why I'm sitting in an office looking pretty stupid in a big floppy hat. Well, it's not, <laughs> it's not a big floppy hat. It's actually a Terry Towling hat. Uh, that was invented by a good mate of mine and a mate of mine for the better half of 30 years we've been best mates, Charlie Martin, and uh, we're going to have a chat about the Terry today. Uh, Charlie, thanks for having me on the farm. Yeah, good to have you on, Rod. Uh-huh, my little mate from, yeah, years and years ago. Mate, we're, we go back a long way, and actually, yes. before, before we had a chat today, I think uh, I ran the numbers, and I think it was 1989 when or 1988 or 1989, when a young bloke from uh, Cassilis came down to boarding school at King's and it was a little shy bloke from the country and uh, he wouldn't talk. And <laughs> they decided to put him next to the little city sticker that wouldn't shut up to try and get him to talk. So we were sort of paired up at school back then and uh, mate, a friendship mate, was born. awesome. And it's been a friendship of uh, some, God, mate, if I was any good at maths, I wouldn't be doing this for a living, let me tell you, but what, we're talking 30 <laughs> odd years. Um, I can't 30, count sheep, but. <laughs> 30 odd years of being best mates, and uh, mate, going back over time and looking back over the years that we had, you know, in boarding school, on, on the weekends, you'd be out at my house, um, and affectionately, mate. you know, my family used to call you there, their country son and uh yep. oh, the city mum. would be up in up in Cassilis with uh with your mum and dad and your sisters and uh they were my country family and uh mate it was great times it was really great times but um mate tell me about this hat that I'm wearing okay and this is a uh, a business of Char that Charlie and his wife Phoebe have developed it's called the Terry and it's uh 100% Terry Towling hat, and while I might look stupid sitting in the office wearing a Terry, I'll tell you what, I've been wearing a Terry for, 12 years, uh, for the last 12 months out on the farm, and it's a bloody good product. Uh, tell us how you started the business, mate, and uh, what made you come up with the idea? Yeah, well, it's, um, it's pretty funny that, yeah, Rod and I have known each other, he became yeah, my little city family there. So, and basically how the Terry came about was, it's a pretty simple story, really. We, um, Phoebes and I got married in 2007 on Australia Day. Which I was a groomsman at, I might add. Yes. So, that was a big day. Yes, so basically it was like a big fat wog wedding and we had, I think there was nine groomsmen. There was, yeah. Um, and we had those board shorts. Remember those board shorts you made us wear? There was no suits. So there was those floral bloody boardies that we wore as uh, as your bridal party. <laughs> well, that was a funny <laughs> thing. Still got them, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm hoping they still fit you, mate. I still got mine. I cut about in them. But that's the funny thing. Like you know, people have a wedding and everyone does everything. You know, the same traditional blah blah blah. And, Thieves and I sort of thought, well, let's do something different that, you know, everyone's going to talk about years later and remember it. So being, yeah, country people, we, the traditional thing is to wear, you know, the black tie wedding, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, tuxedo and what have you. Yeah. And as it works out, weddings are, you know, they're meant to be about the bride and the groom, but really they're not. They're about everyone else and, you know, they run around doing everything, blah, blah, blah. And we, we made a decision, okay, well, let's do a bit different. So we had um, Terry Towling hats as a headwear. We had a white shirt with Australia flag on the Lay back. On the back the, yep. And the, um, the red in the Union Jack had to be pink because all the girls wore pretty dresses. So it was going to clash with the dresses if it was red. So that was good. We did it like that. And then Okanui shorts and then double pluggers that had Australia written on them. So it was obviously Australia Day. So, it, you know, that Australian sort of 
theme and it actually the girls dresses and our random feral Okinu, well not feral but awesome coloured Okinui shorts all sort of matched up and it worked well and I suppose that's probably where the so I never got a, a wedding ring so I made my hat my wedding ring so I made the Terry a wedding ring so I'd been a farmer just went well you know wedding rings are a waste of money let's make something that's practical that you can use so literally I had feeds, Chuck and Feeves written on the front and then we've put on the back our anniversary date as in Australia Day, uh, if you have a look there, Australia Day and then the year and me being a hopeless bloke, I can't remember dates and all those sorts of things. And then we had kids and I struggled remembering their names and their date of birth and that. So that's written on the side. So both kids' names are on the side with their date of birth. So when people go, yep, um, you know, how old are your kids or what's their names? You just got to pull your yeah, I have that. I have that little blank moment and I go, right, well, let's just work that out. And yeah, so, and then we flogged that Terry that hard that we got to a point that we had to find new ones. So the mob that we got them from, then they'd gone out of business or we couldn't find them and we couldn't find any quality Terry telling hats in Australia. So Phoebes and I said, right, well, let's make a business. And as simple as that, that's why the Terry Australia started because we wanted to find myself a new wedding ring and then we've made a business out of it. And yeah, that pretty well sums up how it started. But Terry, in a nutshell. Terry, Terry Towing hats were an institution back in the days. Like, well, all out. Years and years ago, like, your great grandfather probably out on the farm wore a Terry Towing hat. Like, are you, you bringing, you know, simplicity back? Like, do you know anything about the history of Terry Towing hats and who used to use them? Well, actually, I'd, I ran into a a fella that, yeah, from when we met at school, Angus Harris. Yeah. Um, as in Harris Farms. Yeah. And I've never followed up, but I probably need to, but his grandfather actually brought the Terry Towling hats into Australia. Yeah. Initially, he started them all. So it's something that, yeah, I need to um, actually follow up with Gus and, yeah, sort of get a proper story and have that on our website. and. But that's where it came from. So we, when we started it or when we got it going, they used to be the old narrow brim, very short brim. And as yep. you notice, the one you're wearing and the one we're wearing, I'm wearing, we invented a wider brim. So we got two, two sizes, a six centimetre brim, a narrow brim and a wide brim, eight centimetre. And that, that was a six month sort of carry on to make sure that it wasn't too wide, but it was wide enough to protect the tip of your nose. It's that simple. So I'll the tell you, doesn't burn your nose. I'll tell you what I love about these hats. And, you know, I I actually bought these hats for all my stuff, okay? Off you, I think we got about 40 or 50 Terry hats off you at the time. When I'm planting strawberries in March in Caboolture, mate, it's stinking hot, okay? And you're, yep. you're out there, and you're sweating in places that you didn't even know you had. Um, <laughs> I love the fact that I can just pull this off, wipe my face, put it back on, and... And you don't know about it. You don't know about it? And well, also, it's, like a, it's a towel brain, on your head, mate. I'm not getting burnt at the back of my neck, and whenever I was planting strawberries, I was always bending over, and the sun would always hit you at the back of the neck. But because this wide brim's a little bit flexible, it, um, I never get burnt at the back of the neck. I never get burnt on the ears. Um, and it's- And your nose too. And it's bloody durable. You can just throw it in the wash today and uh, you know, put it in the dryer for 20 minutes and it's back on your head tomorrow. Um, mate. Well, that's a, that's a beauty of it. I've got a different, different hat. Each day I'll just go into the wardrobe and just pull a new one out. And then the one from today or yesterday just goes in with the rest of the clothes, goes through the normal wash, you either hang up or throw it through the dryer if it's yeah, if it's wet or whatever. And it's literally a towel on your head, mate. So 
Yeah, we've we've actually got a, a slogan for the business is, is there anything a Terry can't do? And... I'm going to put you on the spot now. Tell me 10 things a Terry can do. Oh, mate. <laughs> well, literally, uh, we've been on the road and, um, you know, kids get car seat sick and had to use it as a spew bucket. <laughs> that's that's one thing that, yeah, little fella he gets a bit car sick. So throw it in there, you throw it out and then just throw it back in the wash. It's all happy days, no dramas, no mess in the car. Um, the big ones, well, I suppose, yeah. The one I like to say is, in the day, it's a good way to crack a, crack a stubby and buddy, yeah, you can use it as a stubby cooler. If you spill your beer at the bar, you can wipe up, up your mess, <laughs> throw it back on your head. As Rod was saying before, especially when you sweat, and a lot of hats, um, you sweat and wearing a hat makes it worse. But the beauty yeah. of the Terry is, you literally wipe up the sweat, put it back on your head, and it sucks it all in because it's literally a towel. So, and there's two, two layers of the Terry, and then there's a cotton, so it's 100% cotton. So, yeah. Um, and then uh, other things, yeah, like, you know, you get grease or doing things with machinery or whatever, you just use it to wipe it up and, yeah, it all washes out. Um, so you can uh, do a lot more with a terry on your head than you can do with like an Akubra hat. Well, there's not, yeah, well, that's it. It's a practical Akubra and a very cheap Akubra too. Mm. So like we sell them online for 30 bucks and Akubra is, you know, you're looking at 200 bucks for an Akubra that, and I always found, you know, when you're on the motorbike or on a horse or whatever, if you've got a bit of speed up on a Cuba, you've got to take it off. Yeah. And the beauty with the Terry, you just fold up and it stays on your head. So, you you know, you can sit 50 Ks, 100 Ks on a motorbike, fold up and it stays on your head. I think but, one of the, one of the favourite things I love when I hear you talk about the Terry, you always say, is there anything the Terry can't do? Uh, you work out over the last five to six years, the Terry couldn't make it rain and, uh, the family yeah. farm down there in Cassilis, you've, you've had a, a rough trot with the drought over the last couple of years, haven't you? Yeah, no, she, um, well, like everyone's gone through it, it just smashed everything and, you know, spending a lot of money on um, buying feed in. We had a massive supply feed before we came into the drought and normal droughts, you know, they happen like everyone is prepared for them but this one was just one that kept going for years longer and there was extended periods that you ne like i suppose it, you do get breaks and then you get a bit of feed but this one the only breaks we got was there was no rain and then you got a heap of rain it washed all washed all all your topsoil mm. into dams and we spent a lot of money on cleaning out all the dams and then we ended up getting Oh, I was like six or eight inches over, a, you know, like a day, and all the money we spent on cleaning the dams, it filled them straight up filled again. Straight back up with silt. And yes, so it must have been a hard time, Chucky, because like I've I've known your family since I was, you know, 10, 12 years old, and I spent a lot of time at your your family's farm, family house, growing up, and some of my best memories were shit we used to get up to on school oh, yeah. holidays up at your place and uh well, the, the you know, fishing. I, my my father grew up in the markets getting up at three o'clock in the morning and you know he got home left home in the dark and, and got home in the dark and mate and all the times i'd seen your dad and all the times i spent up there you know he's a very hard worker and he was always gone by the time you and i got out of bed and uh you know he'd be home at dark, have his dinner, have his cup of tea on his lounge and fall straight to sleep. Uh, yeah. It's it's a tough, tough business farming. It's it's non-stop. And, uh, you know, I look at the times that I spent up there with you guys, you know, your, your mum would be up at five o'clock in the morning feeding potty calves and she'd be in the kitchen by 11 o'clock baking biscuits for us. Um, you know, it's, it's non-stop and it must have been a really tough time over the last couple of years, because 
in any business, you can control a lot of situations, but, um, and we're seeing it in farming at the moment, in horticulture, with the labour crisis, because of COVID and borders shut, you know, we can't control that. And a drought's much the same, you can't control the drought. And uh, mate, I've seen some really bad footage over the last sort of 12 to 18 months, to two years of, of farmers that have just done it so goddamn tough and, and spent every last cent on feed. Um, mate, how did you get through all that? And I guess was the Terry something that you looked at during that tough time to say, shit, I better look at doing something else because, you know, I don't want to be a farmer all my life and deal with, you know, being in the hands of the gods. Is that a fair assumption? Oh, there's no doubt, mate. Like, it, you know, when we set that up, it was, um, I suppose, you know, a little thing that happened and as as just said then, but it was like diversifying so that you've, you know, you've got another income that you can support yourself or whatever. And in hindsight, it was just something that we thought we'd just, um, you know, fill in a bit of time and do it and actually realise that, yeah, it is, you know, something that can can be an off-farm thing, I suppose, and that's a big thing with a lot of farmers to have an off-farm sort of situation. Some people do real estate or this or that or whatever that can Suffer cross over, so to speak. Income, yeah, because it's hard yeah, to get and my farm. So I suppose, yeah. Um, and we're not talking a, lo- a little farm, like your your family's combined holdings in, you know, up there at Cassilis, you're talking, God, how many thousand acres have you guys got? Running cattle, right. sheep, and what have you. Like, yeah, there was the whole family between Gap Heath and Rotherwood yeah. and everything. It, it's a fair whack. There's a fair whack there. Like, there's no doubt about that. And um, quite a yeah, quite a big operation. Having you know two sisters and brother-in-laws, <laughs> so Soph and Soph and Sauce and uh, Sears and Troy, then Mum and Dad. Like, it's yeah, like between all, it's you know a lot of families trying to look after too. So yeah. it's. But yeah, droughts like that, just, uh, I suppose, the amount of money that you've got to, to spend on keeping your stock alive. So you, you have options, like our our situation, having a stud, like a Hereford stud. So there's a lot of a lot of breeding over, you know, have registered stud cattle. They've been recorded every parent back to the turn of the century. So you know, registered stud animals. And then when you have to make calls that you get to a point that the bank has said no more yeah. as in lending and you've been spending, you know, getting six or seven uh, truckloads of hay from South Australia or Western Australia every week, there comes a point that you just can't keep them alive. So we had to sell off. We had to make some very big decisions and sold off where we we've cut the herd down to bugger all and that's probably something you're gonna ask is or you know fr- you've got to um it's like try to rebuild that herd yeah, but it takes thing. a lot of years yeah so yeah we years and years and years of you know genetics and stud bulls and making yeah. sure that you've got you know a premium product i know that the family has a has a bull sale every year, which is very, very in demand because uh, in the Hereford and Paul Hereford industry, your father is, or uh, well, the whole Martin family, I should say now, is renowned as as being one of the leaders. But you know, and we, 20, 30, 40 years of building up a a massive, sizable, as you said, herd to yeah. have to rebuild again because of the drought. Like, yeah, you, and you, that's you, what you, it, you need a Terry to stop yourself from pulling your hair out. Yeah, well, literally, it's, yeah, the old, the old fella, he's got no hair, and I'm lucky. I've got my mother's mother's father's side, so I've still got hair on my head, but he lost his early. And But in saying that, like, our our thing with the with the stud, we're a bit different, everyone else too, because we've, um, we'd sell bulls, but then our bread and butter was, uh, we'd sell 200, say, 200 to 250 cows and calves, first, first calf. Yeah. Uh, commercial cows or heifers with calf on foot and what we did we would join all our um, 
sables, so they all get sold as two-year-olds, but we'd join them all as yearlings and we'd run them all as one mob and we did things very, or we do do things very different to a lot of other places. So we relied on the cows for our, yeah, um, um, bulls, yeah, yeah. like that, that was our bread and butter, not so much the bulls because the bulls had all been, they'd all been joined as yearlings and we, you know, you get 2000 calves or whatever from those bulls. So they'd already paid their own. So whatever they made when they sold, well, that was a bonus because we didn't feed the crap out of them. Yeah. They ran them all as one mob and it was a fair bit of that Darwin's law, you know, survival of the fittest and the ones that have any mouse about them um, would be the ones that would like end up in the sale team. But because of this drought, we've we nearly got rid of all our commercial cows. So, you know, sort of numbers of 1,500, we'd ended up back to about 60. And that was a couple of years ago, and now we're trying to rebuild that. So it's very hard to rebuild because cattle are like humans, nine months gestation, and they only, well, you hope they only have one calf. So once they have two, it's a pain in the ass. But <laughs> if they have twins, but... Yeah, like to rebuild it takes a lot of years and that's probably why the cattle prices are so good at the moment. The cattle and prices are insane. I've, I've been speaking to a few. Um, I've got a mate of mine actually that's got a strawberry farm and a cattle farm. And I said to him the other day, I said, mate, I said, are you sick and tired of pulling money out of your cattle? I said to put into your strawberries because he keeps making money on cattle this year and keeps losing money on strawberries. And he looked at me and goes, mate, you're not wrong. But, um, but the funny thing, the funny thing, really you say, the funny thing you say there is, it's they're probably they're heading to where they should have been twenty years ago. Correct. And they're just getting, but it's had to take such a bad drought over the whole country to reduce the actual numbers that much that you know they'll sort of supply demand curve. But. It had to be that bad to actually make the prices go to where they sh should be or should have been years ago. Look, it, they, look, once the numbers build up, it's going to level out. There's no doubt. But you know, we've we've actually got a very big sheep operation. Yeah, and I sheep always, are going too, aren't they? We're even, but I've always made jokes, and Dad's made jokes that yeah, the sheep used to pay for our cattle hobby <laughs> because the sheep, you know, the sheep prices used to be a lot better than uh, like sheep meat compared to uh, beef was always, you know, more expensive. And so to speak, so yeah, now the, the cattle, I suppose, in hindsight have like catch caught up with them, but the sheep is still going further in front, which, you know, awesome for people to actually pay some debt back. And then you've farmers. got the You've got the curveball of feral goats, which nobody wanted, but a lot of people have told me have kept them going to a certain extent through the drought. At least they got something out of rounding up all the feral goats. Well, we, we, there's another thing we did a bit. Yeah, we actually mussed them up and we've domesticated them. And we've actually, yeah, set up a goat herd, so to speak, of, um, just from ferals that we've domesticated. Yes, it's a nightmare trying to keep them in paddocks and you've got to spend a lot of time fixing fences because they're worse than crossbred sheep. They go yeah. where they want, when they want. And um, But in saying that, we've gone further in front. We've, like at, at home, like very bad for St. John's Wort. So, so we oh, sort man, of kept the guys. I remember spraying St. John's Wort with you out at your farm. I absolutely hated that job. Yeah, that's it, mate. On the old backpack, and it's like, yep. Yeah. But the you come home for a couple of bloody weeks, and that's yeah. That's what you do. Then. Spray St. John Wort. And yeah, sadly I this I year. I lasted about half a day before I said, "No nah, shit, this is too hard. Let's pack it in." It's like stuff you, Chuck. It's not. Who'd want to be a bloody farm? Mate, you made me do. You made me do a lot of crazy stuff out of that farm as a kid. No, I, oh, mate, you. Mate, I, if you, you ask me, what the best memory is of that farm, it's probably that farm. Yeah, you made me do a lot of crazy stuff out of that farm as a kid. No, I, I can remember <laughs> going over to Dow Keith one day with you, and we must have been, you know, twelve or thirteen, and they were castrating all the <laughs> the lands. Do you remember that? Yeah, and. You're and not a man until you rip one out with your mouth. I think, I think it was your uncle, or one of your uncles, or somebody was there and he was slitting the sack and he was putting his teeth in and he was spitting them 
out and he's setting them on the ground and he's all the the blokes you know the country guys are out ah oh, come here you city bloke yeah I bet you you don't you know you don't have the guts to do it tell them what I did Chucky did I know it oh mate you're all over it <laughs> you bloody you know that's why we're good mates mate because you have a crack <laughs> like s- simple as that mate like it's you know straight like, out sort of, straight out open slip the the, the sack and straight in with the teeth and straight out yeah, like, like this. coming down Mate, they don't, surely to God, there's some technology. They don't do it that way now, they surely. Nah, I just, they got a sh- like a better <laughs> knife. But yeah, nah, a lot of people still do it that way. Like it's it's a lot quicker way to do it. But yeah, nah, I, I did did have doubts in my mind if you'd have a crack, but no, you stepped straight up and just straight in and just said, yep, yeah, I'll have a go. That's, look, that's life. You I don't think go. I had a choice. I don't think anyone was going to let me live it down if I didn't. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure I had you by the nuts, and if you weren't going to do it, I'm going to get squashed fairly hard, mate. So, yeah, I made sure you had a go. But, mate, but they, yeah. were, they were some of the best times of my life, the times we spent out at your hey. place in, in school holidays, you know, from, from rainbow trout fishing to getting yabbies to going out and, and on the know, bikes hunting and, roos and riding yeah. horses and... Charlie, with his monstrous chicken enterprise that you had there growing yeah, up as a kid with all your, your Sussex chooks and your Kaki yeah. Campbell ducks and your yeah. incubator that you used to freaking incubate all your, your your chickens in. Actually, I think that's oh, that's where you got the, the name Chook and Chook sort of yeah. stuck all the way through school because of uh, your love yeah. of Chooks back then. Yeah, no, it was sort of, you bring back a few memories there that, yeah, that's it, mate. That's where Chul came from, so, yeah. And, of Not, course, our, our families were, you know, and still are to this day, very close. And I, I remember the very first day my father met your father and uh, it was an end of the term and your your dad and mum were coming down to pick you up and um, your dad turns up in a Mercedes Benz with a monstrous pull bar on the front. And everyone's <laughs> looking at all looking at this band with a bull bar and then he pulls up, meets my dad, shakes hands, your dad opens a boot and he pulls out a lamb carcass of a lamb he killed the day before to give to my father. Well, you know, put <laughs> that to an Italian. A friendship was formed there, that was gonna be a friendship for life. But well, there's no doubt about that. That was that's the country hospitality there in a nutshell, isn't it? And that's yeah. um, you yeah. don't see those sort of things anymore. Yeah, times have changed that, um, you know, I think that what we experienced being two blokes so completely different, yeah. uh, yet being able to, to come and chalk, mate. as best mates and, uh, and you know, go to um, spend a, a time at each other's places over, you know, weekends and school holidays, mate, it was some of the best times of my life. It really was. Oh, it, it helped me, mate, being a country boy and just, yeah, having a buddy, having a um, home in the city that, yeah, your mum and dad are like country mum and dad. It's that simple, but I mean, my city mum and dad that, yeah, I, you know, like that was, that helped me through all those years of boarding school that having, having somewhere to go on a weekend that you got out of school. Like, it's pretty full on boarding school, that, especially when you, I don't know, my daughter's, she's 11 or 12 at the moment, and we were talking about it. She's in year six, and that's when I started. So I said, well, it's like you're going to boarding school now. And she sort of looked at me and went, yeah, it's a bit full on, isn't it? So having a family that looked like took me under the wing, and you guys did that without a doubt, like, had my own bedroom, everything was just, yep, just. And we had a bloody good, and we had a bloody good time. Oh, there's no doubt about that. And just, I suppose, you know, the working culture of young man and mum of, you know, similar to my parents of straight away, we we had that bond, I suppose, of that, yeah, That's you fun. you put in and you have a go and that makes life happen. I want to ask you a brief question because there's something that I've wanted to know quite a while. Now, obviously, when we're talking beef, and I'm a, I'm a fruit and veg man, as you know, I'm, I'm not yeah. a beef man. I, the only thing I know about beef is how to eat it, and I can probably tell you every single cut on a, on a cow because I've eaten every single cut. But <laughs> you've got your Herefords, you've got your Brahmins, you've got your Angus, um, Charolais, all these different varieties. Um, all the five-star restaurants and that, 
all go off about, oh, we've got Angus beef, Angus beef. You know, is, is Angus beef actually better or is it they've just got a better marketing arm that know how to market it? Because I'll tell you something now, probably the best piece of steak I've ever had is some Hereford Prime that your dad gave me uh, a couple of years ago when he came to visit. And um, mate, I, is, there, is there a difference between breeds and taste and flavour? There actually is, mate. Like, it's actually funny, the old, the old Angus have been very good at marketing themselves and literally, yeah, you know, like I'm a staunch Hereford breeder, so I'm going to be a bit biased here, but I honestly believe that uh, the Angus were really good. They marketed themselves really well and, look, sadly, the old Herefords had two, like, they had, like, a horned animal and a polled animal. Yeah, and there's there's breeders that were sort of staunch in either side, and as a breed, there became a um, divide there, I suppose, in hindsight. And when Angus were being really good marketing themselves, when Herefords used to be the predominant breed of all cattle in Australia, uh, we in hindsight put our heads in the sand and we sort of kept fighting in between ourselves about oh, are they horned or they're polled and forgot to market ourselves. So Angus went out there and marked themselves really well and basically at the end of the day, if you actually, well, probably the drought's a good thing for Herefords because they're the ones that stay alive, get back in calf, don't have to be looked after as much as Angus like you. The Angus breeders have to spend a lot more money in getting their product to a point that is saleable compared to Hereford. So for, when you're talking two different breeds, Angus, most stuff that is sold at restaurants, blah, 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 have all had to be grain fed. Yeah. And then there's, you know, it's... Is there a, a difference lot of, in taste between grain and grass fed? There's another question there, I want to ask. There actually, there actually is a difference, like as in grass fed meat, Compared to grain fed, you can taste the difference. It's just, I don't know, like, you know, the way the world is, everyone going on about natural this, natural that, and but Hereford's actually finished on grass. Yeah. So much better than Angus or other breeds. And that's what the Herefords have. Of, they're a very, um, you know, I call, I actually call Herefords like the equivalent to Dramans, but the Southern cattle. Yep. So dra Brahmins are bred for, you know, extremes of the north. Yeah. But Herefords are up, actually up in those areas, but they, in hindsight, well, you know, production point of view is they've all got to get back in calf and stay alive and rear a calf and do this, and but they can do that on grass, not much at all. Yeah. But the, old, the old Angus, you've got to look after them. Like, you've got to rack them in cotton wool and... Mm. If they don't get the lollies, um, yeah, they fall apart and yeah, don't reproduce. You know, conception rates are right down. The old Hereford, you can flog them to nothing and they'll still yeah, get back in calf. Breed, aren't they? Then, and then from an eating point of view, well, the old grass fed, you know, there's no doubt that there's a different taste. Like it's mm. huge. You can and can't taste it, but I'll eat grass. Like, you know, sadly, I've been so spoiled by being brought up on Herefords. When we go to the restaurants, I actually buy fish or seafood. <laughs> I don't, I won't buy a steak because I know that I won't be happy with it. Yeah. Just because, you know, yeah, literally, it's probably marketed or grown. Well, you know, it's like, it's like me when I walk into a, a restaurant and they're serving, you know, strawberries and cream, um, strawberries and ice cream for dessert. I pretty much can look at that strawberry and know the variety. And yep. I can nearly, up until recently, where now everyone in strawberries growing the same super variety, but before different growers would grow different varieties, and I could almost be sitting in a restaurant in Melbourne and eat strawberries and cream and tell you not only what variety that strawberry was, but who actually grew it. And, yeah, um, you'll know where it's dead. And I know where the it's whole come process. from. And yeah. you know, someone would look at me and go, oh, these strawberries are fantastic. And I'd be looking at them going, what are you smoking? You know? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, when, you're, not that good. when you're an expert and in your field and you're passionate, 
in your field. You, you're right, you can tell the difference. And what might be a, a normal pub steak to me certainly wouldn't be a normal pub steak to you because uh, you know you know a lot more about what's gone into that steak before it's got on the grill. Yeah, and look, I suppose it comes into cooking a bit too, but at the end of the day, it's a lot in the breeding and what breed it's come from. So, and that's why we've stuck with Herefords and not gone, you know, down the black line because we know that to produce a Hereford to a point, saleable point, you're going to save yourself a lot more money than producing Angus. Admittedly, they mark themselves really well and they get premiums. But when you take all that out of it, you're going to save a lot more money and, yeah, be in front with how, the Hereford cattle. How's the feed situation at home now? Is the drought well and truly over or are you still... Oh, yeah, no, she's... It, it, it's as good as, as as it's ever been, mate. Like, as in, you know, when you... When we were kids in the good years there, like, it's, it's even better than that, mate. Like, it's, you know, and that's Mother Nature, like, you... Yeah. You know, farming, and I well, suppose so something they call it father nature. Yeah, well, something you actually, <laughs> something you were actually saying before about like all this Corona sort of carry on, blah blah blah, and businesses now in cities have been affected by all this carry on. Well, probably how I word it is, they're just going through a drought that normal farmers go through. Yeah, it's probably so a very good assumption, Joe. Yeah, yeah they're, they're probably a very good assumption. They're having to learn how to how to live, like deal with life when something that's so much out of your control is in mother nature, right. like rain, and it's out of your control. So all these businesses that have had to be shut down because all these lockdowns, blah, 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 they've had to diversify and find different ways to stay in business like farmers do and reduce costs and change the way you do things. And I, I you know, do. I do a lot of work down in Stanthorpe, a place called Stanthorpe, which is three hours away from Brisbane. And yeah, yeah. Stanthorpe climate is very cold, so you can grow a lot of the crops that you generally grow up here in the winter, you can grow them over summer down there. And Stanthorpe's gone through three years of the worst drought, probably on par with what you guys went through. Well, they nearly ran out. They nearly ran out of water for the town. Well, like pretty it much, yeah, they did. That and, close. And growers were were spending. I know one grower that was spending thirty thousand dollars a week just cutting in water. Um, you know, to, to water his crops. You know, five or six big farms down there hit the wall this year. Get off the back of the drought. But those poor bastards down there now. You know, they've got a bumper crop because everything's as good as it's ever been. But now they've got no pickers to pick it because of COVID. So well, that's uh, that's the thing know, that that's, yeah, the... that's tough for them to swallow because for three years they've done you know deferred payments with the banks and all those sort of things that farmers do during the drought, and now all of a sudden they've got a beautiful crop, and the bank's gone. Hey, how's that crop looking? Yeah, crop's looking good. We don't just but... want our money from this year. We want our money from the last two years, and yeah. that's that's tough to take in, you know, I see a lot of growers in Stanthorpe really anxious because they're like, shit, what if we can't get the workers? But, you know, the borders are opening up, the world is slowly coming back to, to normal. So with a bit of hope in January, they should be okay. Mate, let's let's go back and talk about this magnificent invention here. Yeah, the, the Terry, all right, now, one of the things I want to do on having yarn on the farm over the next couple of weeks is I want to talk to people in country areas that have businesses that other country folk might want to support. And one of the reasons I want to do this is, you know, I spend a lot of time down in Stanthorpe, but on Fridays in Stanthorpe, there's a little farmer's market that they have there and all the farmers go there and sell some of their product. And one of the things that I find really, really nice, I guess is the word I'm trying to put is, how many of the locals go there to support that farmer's market because they want to support like-minded people in their industry. Um, yeah. You don't want to be, as a farmer, and everyone's looking for a gift idea for Christmas or something to send someone, you don't want to be getting on bloody Amazon and buying something on Amazon and supporting a corporate. You want to be supporting another country folk where, you know, you're helping out 
your country brothers and sisters. So, the Terry, what a fantastic idea for a Christmas present, and I'll tell you why. And <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to do the marketing here for you, Chucky. Right, oh, mate, you, you've All always right. been good at that, bud. Okay, I'm going to do the marketing here for you. The first thing why the Terry is a good idea, okay, as a Christmas present, it's unique. Okay, I guarantee you, if you give someone a Terry. They ain't gonna get a terry off anyone else. Where you go give them a bottle of scotch, they've probably got six bottles of scotch already behind their bar. <laughs> yeah, they ain't gonna appreciate right it. All right? They put that terry on their head. First thing everyone's gonna say, my God, where'd you get that? Second, you see our Queensland Farm Management, my brother's company, is logoed on here. You can put your logo on it, so it's a good marketing tool. All right? You don't have to be like Charlie, who, uh, you know, had to put his anniversary in his kid's name to get a little bit slow. <laughs> you can actually put your logo on here. And this is a great idea if you're looking at a gift to give suppliers or reps or, you know, blokes that come out to your farm from, you might have your mate from Elders that's gone in and back for you during the drought and, you know, he's got you a little bit extra line of credit and you want to thank him. Mate, he's going to wear this and he's going to go around and he's going to be promoting your business. So you can get the logos put in, it's unique, but more importantly, it's effective, all right? As I said Works. before, you can, there's so many uses of the Terry, okay? And Charlie went through some of the uses of the Terry. It's actually really comfortable. Like during this interview, I've had, that, I've had it on my head. And uh, for, for something that's Terry Towering, it's, it's actually not that heavy, so it's, it's quite light, but it's also it, it's also snug, so that, like you said, mate, if you're on a horse or you're on a bike or something, you, it ain't gonna fly off because it's actually quite snug. I mean, this one here's a double XL because I've got one of my workers that's got a really big head and I've got this one for him. Um, but I recommend when looking at sizing for, for Charlie uh, on the Terry, you know, I've got a heap of double XLs and they're, they're actually really big, so maybe look at a large or a medium, unless you've got a couple of blokes with a really big head. And I guess a good thing it caters for people with small heads and big heads too. So, um, you know, Charlie. There's, there's seven different sizes there, mate. Seven, so it goes, there's, there's seven different sizes. So it goes from extra, extra small to extra, extra large, and they go up two centimeters a size. So, from newborn kids, the extra, extra small at 51 centimetres, two centimetres up to 63 for the extra, extra large. So there's, in somewhere there, there's a hat for everyone. So what, what sort of people are buying the Terry's at the moment? Like uh, I've been on your, your Facebook page and um, mate, everyone's in a Terry. Even I think, poor, I think you're running the Gladys Vera Jiggly and I don't think I saw her in a Terry, although she'd be using it to wipe the tears off now. She's in, she's in a little bit of shit, isn't she? So, but that's just another example of, you know, yes. is there anything a Terry can't do? Poor old Gladys would be going like this right about that's now it. with her Terry. Uh, what, sort of, what sort of that's people it, are buying the Terry, shall we? Oh, everyone, mate, you name it. Like, it's amazing all around Australia. And yeah, if you going overseas too, though. Like, but just everywhere, every day, the orders, because we obviously got it online, so yeah, the uh, online business, but then from, uh, um, so we wholesale them to, to shops, and say in the back, back part of the well, I suppose I should give Phoebe some pretty massive raps because yeah, she's the engine you know, room. She, Charlie's wife Phoebe is the brains behind it because you can. Well, she does. You, you can she see does all the work throughout this interview that Charlie's not the brains behind anything. So, no, um, I'm. I'm just a pretty face. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I'm. I'm the face of the Terry, and that's about it. She's done everything. She's built the website. She does everything. She's amazing. We got it. So it's all yeah wholesale. So there's. There's a section there, stockers list, that you click on that and you put all your info in and then get wholesale prices if you're a yeah, if you're a if you're a shop or whatever. So if you're a shop but, in a country town, I know there's a lot of farmers that, you know, their their wives have got little boutiques in town that, you know, we're talking about before supplementing your income. You can't, you know, sometimes two, three families all can't survive on a farm income and uh, is there an opportunity for these little boutiques in these country towns to deal directly with the Terry and buy them at a wholesale price? 
Yeah, so they're yeah, it's it's there's they're in a fair few country towns, um, and it's literally we just sign you up and give you a portal to get into the wholesale site. So all the um, all the prices there are numbers that you buy, and then what's on hand is in um, like the different. So there's so many different colours and yeah. sizes, and you got the wide and narrow brim. So yeah, in that in that background thing, you can. You can jump on there and order straight from there. So it's no what about colours? You've got, you got shitloads of colours and what heaps happens? of different colours. You name it, they are be a good question how many there are, but they're and also visors too, like girls like visors. So we've um yeah. What's what's, what's the website, Jackie, if people want to get on and have a have a uh, little bit of a look? It's literally the Terry Australia. The Terry Australia. Dot com dot au or whatever. So you get online, you pick your hats, um, and then what about if you want embroidery and that done? Um, so, how's that work? Like, do they ring you or do you email for a logo? What's the, how's it work? So, your best way there is to email through like an inquiry and give as much info as you can from your company because you need all that sort of stuff, as in, you know, address and blah, blah, blah. And Phoebes will do a quote for you if you. You know, like we work on... And she's very efficient, Phoebe. Like I, when I bought mine, I think I bought 50 and, you know, let's be real, I wouldn't order them from Charlie. He'd stuff it up, so... I, yeah, without a doubt. I, I, I sent an email through to... It was really simple because I sent an email through to the Terry Australia and uh, I said, look, you know, I'm chasing 50 Terry hats for my staff, um, you know, and straight away Phoebe got back to me and said, well... You know, we'll do a mix and match of sizes and what have you. She's like, do you want the logo put on? I flick the logo through. Um, by memory, I think Phoebe sent me back a um, like a proof of what it would look like. Um, I said, yep, good to go. And mate, within within a week, I had the workers out there um, wearing them, you know, out on the farm. So the turnaround was was really quick, considering we had to get them all um, embroidered. So to speak. But um, yeah, there it's is, pretty, pretty easy. There is a few and delays here at the moment. Terry, isn't it? What's that? I said it's a pretty easy and painless process. It is. No, like, Phoebe's has got it set up. She's pretty amazing. She's actually, last couple of weeks, been trying to teach me how to use the computer. And it's like, yeah, I reckon she's lost a fair bit of hair there. So she's she's awesome at it. Um, tell, her, tell, her I've got, tell her I've got a saying, all right, and just let her know. So you spoke to Rob about. And I know this because I had to teach her how to try and get on Zoom, and that was no easy task because Phoebe wasn't here. So let 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 Phoebe know that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Yeah, right. I was going to say that you, you you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And also, you know, if we put you in charge, you know, someone that orders fifty is likely to get five hundred. So yeah, um, yeah, you, you you stick to doing well, what you, know, you do. And you know I can't read and write. <laughs> <laughs> Went to a flash school and I still can't spell my own name, let alone my missus' name. <laughs> so terryaustralia.com.au, you, you get on there, you have a look at all the different types of hats. Um, there's some on there too with different coloured side brims and yep. like yours that you've got on now. There's thin yep, yep. brims, there's wide brims, there's sun visors. Um, you can pretty much get anything embroidered on it. And, you know, for me, what a like fantastic who's your daddy? idea to give all the people that have helped you this year that you wanted to send a Christmas gift to, what a fantastic idea to give them one of these because I guarantee if it's from a country town, all right, they'll be wearing it and they'll be, they'll be using it like Charlie does and that is to, you know, what, soak yeah, up nah, the, nah. the schooner at the pub and uh, wiping yeah. the sweat off the brow while he's working out on the farm. So. You wipe uh, your ass if you had to, mate. If you had to, yeah. If you run yeah, out, that's it. <laughs> like you, you said, buddy. Yeah, is with, there anything Terry can't do? If you lost all your pockets from doing the same thing, well, Terry does the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so terryaustralia.com.au is where we can go and uh, place our orders. Um, look, guys, it's a it's a good family business. It's a couple of young people having a crack. Um, it is. It's something that, you know, you can use on the farm. It's a great gift idea coming into Christmas. If you're wondering what to give someone, get
get on the Terry order a dozen of them, um, send them out to people and say, you know, get your logo put on it. I guarantee you, people from, I've seen people wearing Terry's at the beach. I've seen people wearing Terry's at the farm. I've seen people wearing Terry's at the pub. Um, I've seen people wearing Terry's in my house. I know that was Charlie because he wears his Terry everywhere. So, but, <laughs> but you can wear it pretty much with anything, you know. I think that uh, I took Charlie out to dinner when he came up to see me in Brisbane and he walked out with his Terry Dowling hat and I decided to go to Sizzler instead of a, a five-star restaurant because it was, uh, you know, it was probably more to do with his attire, but you can wear it anywhere. But, but more importantly, yeah, these are fantastic for the sun. And we are in coming into summer. We're coming into what's going to be a very hot summer. And um, mate, even as a, if you've got a couple of young kids, like you said, you've got photos, you've got from newborn all the way up. Um, if you've got kids that you're going to, you know, spend some time down the Gold Coast over summer, and you want to make sure that, you know, they're not going to get their little nose burnt, what a better idea than uh, get a couple of Terry's and, you know, get them on their heads. Yeah, mate, you walk in the surf club, throw it in your pocket or in your handbag. You don't have to worry about a big hat. But yeah, that's the beauty. They just fold up into nothing like They do, actually. And look, if I, like, this, this, this is a big one. And like I said, it's a triple XL, right? But you, but you, you scrunch it up. scrunch that up and put it on your head. Yeah. Like, you know, you can put it on your head. You can put it on your back. You can put it on your shoulders. You can put it on your arms. You can put it on your legs. You can put it on your shoulders. You can put it on your back. And then pull it and pull it out and it forms back to and how it was. Pulls out, so it's not, it's not like crippled or crushed or it goes straight back on my head and, uh, yeah. you know, it's good to go. That's, Guys, I reckon my that's best mate of the there. is Charlie Martin, okay, from Dalkeith Herefords and the Terry Australia. Get online, get on to theterryaustralia.com.au um, and order some of these as a great Christmas gift. Uh, for a few reasons. One, because they're practical. Two, because they're fair price. And more importantly, because we're helping other country folk rather than helping all the the big wigs and big corporations. And for a lot of people that listen to my podcast, you, you'll know that I'm a, I'm a big advocate for the little bloke, okay? Um, and I've done a lot of advocacy work for the smaller farmer, making sure the smaller farmer gets a good go. Well, I think we need to go one step further this Christmas and make sure that we keep the money in the country areas, in the country regions, and help out each other rather than helping big corporations. My name's Rodney from I Comply, Charlie. Thank you very much for having me out on the phone with us. And uh, please don't stuff up any of the orders. Just stay away from the computer, okay, when the orders <laughs> come through and let Phoebe handle it. Um, just let Phoebe know that Rodney from I Comply has asked her to get online and she'll make sure that she looks after you really well. She's a, she's a good girl. They're, they've got a good business and they're very passionate about it. Chucky, thanks for having me on the farm. Oh, mate, thank you, brother, from another mother. Hey. Mate, always good to catch up with you and let's hope that uh, these borders open and the world gets back to normal and uh, we can all... I think I'm about time for a due, due for a visit down to Castles to go out and see your family. That's it, and, mate. Uh, yeah, we'll have to make get, that work. I'm sure that you know, if your mum knows that I'm coming, she'll get in that kitchen of hers and she'll start baking. Oh, don't worry, mate. You'll, She's a hell yeah. of a cook, Barb. She's a you'll, hell of a cook. You'll put on 20 kilos in a week. Oh, mate, yeah. I, was never, I, I never actually hated a feed when I went to your mum's place. She no, you never stuff. get hungry there, mate. All right, so. you never go hungry there. There'd be always, there'd be always plenty of Hereford Prime in the in the uh, little abattoir cool room out the back where there'd be always lamb and uh, we never, we'd never go hungry. Don't worry about that. So, yeah, sign off. Mick Gundy from Australia. <laughs> Good on you, Chucky. Thanks, mate. <laughs> Thanks, mate. You're a legend. Good on you, mate. Yeah.